Okay, now I'm no, I am recording, but it won't count towards your total, I don't believe. Uh, let me see. I mean, I can even I can. Play okay, game. so we're gonna do. Why keep saying that? That's the Zoom oh, voice. No. Don't you know anything, Phil? This is this the Zoom oh, yeah. recording. Oh, you heard that too? I thought I was hearing things. <laughs> you are. You're hearing real things. Stop that! I get enough dead people around me at the day time. <laughs> I bet. That's another story. Anyways, I'm gonna start, and uh, let's talk about you first. And if I, I know you. You talk fast and all that, and I might interrupt you just to uh, just to go back because sometimes it goes so fast information, people got to catch up. I can catch up. I can hear you, you know, but uh, I know about you. And then we can go into, and then I'll say, hey, what do you want to talk about today, Adam? And then you can talk about uh, election results. You can talk about that if you want, you know, whatever you want, whatever. It's open to you. But first I want to talk about your personal stuff first. Then we get right. into the other stuff. Okay. Right? And then uh, okay, and then let's do it. also... Uh, I don't know about your uh okay ready okay here we go so I'm gonna start and uh and if I get cut off I'll just say before the next session for the like, two o'clock right because uh the converts and all that okay here we go hey what happened Rec stop recording I think we're recording already it does you says a voice record on this computer yeah it doesn't say a voice yeah, that's because it was already recording. So we're talking already. <laughs> no, your copy. Okay. Well, okay. Your copy. <laughs> I'll do my copy. Okay. Hi, my name. Today, welcome to episode of Cruising with Bill. My name is Bill the Cruise. Today, I'm with my former fellow candidate of War 20 and good friend, Mr. Adam Golding. Hey, Adam. How you doing? Pretty good. You didn't tell me we were going cruising. I would have dressed better. <laughs> so, Adam, this tell, my me, tell the people about Tell, tell about yourself. If you're, uh, tell about your personal stuff first. You know, tell me what you want to know about you. Well, as I was saying before, we got well, quote unquote, on camera proverbially. It's a big topic, and uh, you know, usually it's considered self-indulgent in all of the context in which we've been doing interviews to, because you're supposed to focus on the issues. Not nobody yeah. really cares about you. Yeah, people do care about who, who politicians are in a certain sense, and but it's it's pretty much universally agreed to be kind of a distraction like like people are still talking about like bill clinton's personality or like his story or anybody you know and it's just like but at any rate um so i i have an instinct to not get into this stuff but um i was born in toronto uh my father was a teacher he died of lung cancer when i was one year old uh because of asbestos exposure at his school in don mills collegiate Oh my, gosh. Um, my mother had a widow's pension from the Ontario Teachers Pension Fund, which just had a big hit from the FTX scandal. So that <laughs> seems full circle. If, if that had happened uh, 40 years ago, it would have maybe affected me directly materially, that hack that, that the Ontario Teachers Pension invested in FTX. Um, and my mother had grown up in Barrie, which is where we moved back when I was one. So I was born in Toronto at Mount Sinai. You know, my father was teaching at Don Mills. He wanted to teach at Oise and teach teachers how to teach because he believed that teachers didn't know how to teach. And this is something that my mother passed down to me. And so I had this idea in my head that my father was a teacher and identified very closely with my teachers for that reason to sort of get from them what that like teacher ethos was that I knew my father had had because by all reports, he was a very good teacher and uh, sort of respected by everybody around him. And um, uh, yeah, it's, and, and, but also having this other thing in my head that he also thought that most teachers were incompetent. And um, this was obvious to me, actually. I thought, damn, my dad was right. These, <laughs> these <laughs> teachers don't know what they're doing. And my entire life, I felt that way. Um, I was classified as gifted in grade three. Uh, it was, I had two tests, 142, 147 IQ, which is why it's ironic that I have this t-shirt on now for a job I just started that they never asked for my <laughs> IQ, but the t-shirt actually, I can tell, well, I, according to the arbitrary cult of IQ, this is technically true, but one of the first things I told kids in this class the other day, we were talking about AI was, well, how do you define intelligence? Intelligence could be speed. Intelligence could be memory. Intelligence could be code correctness. And there are a lot of smart people in this world running the wrong code. And you know, um, I know about I know about codes. Yeah, but some people who get in, in, in inducted into the cult of IQ think of IQ as a single dimensional thing, and they just think, oh, just like they think of income. People are obsessed with the idea of coming with a linear ranking of everyone around them, which is really toxic and reductive. And I mean, people are given to be reductive because they're a hunter species, partly, and because we perceive in a mere three dimensions, which is also very reductive. Because I mean, I, I don't really believe that the world is three dimensional, but that's I didn't. 
I'm just getting ahead of us now. I didn't believe that when I was born, uh, so, <laughs> nor does anyone. But so uh, I was raised by my mom and Barry and by her dad, who was, as you know, a military guy in the sense that he was a civil servant at Borden. Um, that was after he had been a cop briefly in Toronto and he had been a streetcar driver. Um, and, and my grandparents had run a farm and, and a, they used to own a convenience store called the Old Stand Store. They moved all around Ontario, but settled in Barrie during my mother's childhood and moved constantly. They were flippers in Barrie, flipping houses. And my mother moved every year. So when I was a kid and we, for legal reasons, couldn't flip our house all the time, she was constantly renovating. <laughs> I was like, to, to, to really achieve that, that transient experience that she had had. Um, and um, yeah, so um, my... Uh, my my father's parents ended up uh, being uh, well. My my um, my father's sister moved to Nova Scotia, and so um, her, her dad Bob Golding went down there, and um, so I was I was closer to my grandparents on my on my mom's side, and uh, was raised basically by my two grandparents and my mom. And my mother had intermittent boyfriends, some of them not so great. My mother dated two dangerous two of the first dangerous offenders in Canadian history. Um, uh, this is for those who don't know, these are people that you lock up and you keep them locked up unless there's a damn good reason to let them out. Uh, you legally can't have a permanent sentence. You have to have this technical possibility that like, well, maybe you'll release them. Um, that's as far as like, we don't have like a true, there's no such thing as a true life sentence in Canada or in America, but we have almost that in Canada called a dangerous offender. And my mother did it two of the first 40. She had Stockholm syndrome for one of these men. And I saw it play out while the, how the dude's own lawyer convinced her to switch sides and testify against him and put him away. This guy, Jimmy Jones. And uh, so I had an early perspective into Stockholm syndrome and domestic abuse and, and you know, policing for sure. Because I saw both sides of it. It's something I was always telling leftists who want to completely abolish the police, completely abolish his unfeminist. Uh, police saved my mother's life multiple times because this guy that she switched sides on actually did escape from prison once and uh, she got on the phone with the other person who was a witness against him and they said which one of us do you think he's coming for first and uh, but the cops got him so they never found out who he was going for first but they assumed he was going to come to kill both of them um, and so you know uh, police definitely sa saved my mother's life uh, that night and probably by locking him up in the first place and I mean the guy was a the guy was a murderer before they even locked him up um and uh, so I had quite a varied experience. My uncle is also a cop, Neil Herdebees. Uh, Herdebees Drive up in Aurelia is named after him. He was the first officer ever shot in the line of duty in Aurelia. And that was uh, definitely affected my family. But my mother was a hippie radical and my my and a visual artist. She had met my father's sister in a silk screening shop where they worked in Toronto. And the very first time they met, they had a heated argument about one of her paintings. And they both called uh, Juanita, my aunt, and said to her, um, that's the most arrogant, opinionated, offensive person I've ever met in my entire life. Like, why the fuck did you introduce me to them? And then she <laughs> said, wow, they're perfect for each other. <laughs> so yeah, they had a, a, a heated, perhaps almost violent argument the first time they met over, over my mother. He had a, apparently a highfalutin, self-important opinion or analysis of her painting. It was like, love at first fight. Eh? Something like that. Well, he was coming from a more academic standpoint you know he had done masters in english masters in education she was she hadn't finished her high school diploma but had gone back to art college and and she also did ece later um and and so there was a bit of a class difference i guess and uh i mean i was probably i think i was maybe the third person in my family to to go to higher education um on either on uh well definitely i think on my on one side definitely third and um the uh so they they, they had that uh connection and uh but my, my mother had to move back to uh back to barry because of his death uh oh yeah so she had been a radical in toronto she had lived in rochdale college and so my father headed this reportedly of course this is all filtered through my mother because i only heard about this through my mother but um uh had wished that he had had the time to be as radical as her that he had been busy in school. And so as much as there was this class advantage one way, which maybe came out in their first argument and she was like, should have took issue with, even with his pompous approach to analyzing her painting or something like that. Like, come on, it's like talk normal type thing. Um, that's the vibe I got from other situations. Uh, it, 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 he wished that he had been able to be radical. And, you know, I had a similar experience when I was working my first job after university and sitting in the cab going to work looking out the window at Occupy Toronto and thinking like, fuck, if I had been in university like one year longer and not starting work this year, I would have been there talking to everybody, seeing what's going on, but I had a full-time job. 
doing computer programming for a startup that was, you know, wanted to get bought out by a corporation or, you know, for IP, which is like, by the way, kids start co-ops. Don't, don't go to either, either do sole proprietorship or do a co-op. You don't want a startup that wants bought up to be bought up by a corporation. Corporations are the problem. Anyway, um, which I mean, my mother certainly didn't work for a corporation. She was mostly on her widow's pension and making art, lots of really great art. She did murals up in Barrie. So anyway, I, I, I grew up in Barrie, went to the gifted class, eventually started studying music um, much later than I wanted to start, actually, and um, well, worked overtime in high school. Sorry? At what age was that? Well, I started piano lessons when I was about 14, but I started writing music on the, comp on the Super Nintendo in grade six. So I was composing before I was performing which probably explains why I've gone sort of not cold turkey, hard turkey in the other direction. <laughs> I've turned a hard turkey turn in the other direction to um, be focused exclusively on performance and not composition. Because uh, I later studied composition. I worked, uh, you know, over time to get ready for university because I had to pass an audition to get into U of T. It was very competitive, uh, especially given that I was starting late, uh, like majorly late. Some people started when they were Two, two, maybe four, I started at 14 formal instruction, right? So it was like, ah, and um, and then even when you get into first year at U of T, um, it's, you're in this weird limbo for the composition program where they, they have this intro class with like 14 people in it who all want to major in composition. And they, they're like, well, we're only going to admit like one or two of you. <laughs> Seriously, it's like Hunger Games. And so, it was, you know, it's not a very good creative environment because scarcity, well, too much scarcity is not good for creativity. You can't have too little either. Like intelligence happens under constraints. That's why oh, yeah. this is why God is probably dumb in Christian theology because he's too powerful to need to be smart. If you see what I mean. <laughs> he doesn't have to figure out how to do it. He just wants it and he gets it. So uh, two people get picked out of the whole bunch. It was actually turned out to be two and a half. But oh, side, side point here about the omnipotence paradox, you know, like God can't be all intelligent and all powerful. This this is this is another way to this. I, I do believe in kind of dismantling aspects of the IQ cult, especially the monodimensional version of it, which is related to the monotheistic God. The monotheistic God is the set of all perfections in Descartes. And if you think that you are all uh, or that the, this God is all uh, powerful and uh, all intelligent, if intelligence is also a perfection, oh, that's an, one of the many contradictions you get in that kind of God, because if you were all powerful, you wouldn't. Intelligence is finesse under limitation. And uh, that's why actually um, sometimes privilege can make people stupid. Um, so, you know, there's a lot to think about there. Um, so yeah, I started music in university. Uh, I feel like maybe you should ask a question at this point. No, that, I was say, not, uh, I'll pause for questions. I just reached university in the story. No, no, I like and then my no, life changes. That was me back, back in Toronto. Toronto. <laughs> you actually, yeah, you actually, yeah. So, uh, so tell people how you did your music. Cause I know I've heard you play, I've seen your webs. You know, you're amazing, right? Oh, right. Well, as I was saying, I pivoted from composition. So it wouldn't really be correct to say that I did well in composition. Most of my composition I did when I was studying composition privately in high school um, and the first few years of my program. But I started to realize I wanted to do improvisation. But that was after kind of getting um, distracted by other subjects. So I was in the music faculty. And after two years of that, I got them to let me uh, enroll in the arts and science faculty at the same time, which was like, I guess, unprecedented at the time because the registrar told me that's impossible. You can't be in both faculties. I'm like, well, they let me do it. I, don't know. I, know, I, just, want to go, I just want to go back to the comp music thing for people in the music. Comp yeah. Can you talk about composition? Composition? Is it? Composition. composition. Yeah. yeah. Explain what that means when you have a, you have a limited, uh, do they give you a directive or is it a limited scope of how you do it or what? When you study composition? Yeah, like do they give you a certain criteria you got to do it? Because you're right now, you're saying you did it later than your before, right? Like, well, it was, it was, like, mainly, it was the was performance kind of, I had to catch up on. Because you're not many, but would it kind of curtail you? Because you're really, you're really designated as a player. You're, you're, you know, you're out there getting down to this university level. You got to like, it's kind of like you're being, you put in this focus. You got to limit yourself now to do this, but you've done all this before. Now you're down to this. So explain the uh, composition for people that. Don't understand that. Um, I don't there, there was a little bit of what you're saying, but that's not what I was just saying. So I wouldn't emphasize no. that. There was well, a bit of that. Like, uh... I was a bit head on theory, but I was not. Um, I was not out performing much. I, I got more into performing later. I had been composing a lot and studying a lot of theory, and um, some of the theory was a bit um, remedial. Um, but performance wise, it was not remedial for me. My technique was um, under strain. Well, actually, okay. So I left out an important part of the story. So. Um, I also had a problem with procrastination, perhaps due to my 
um, you know, abilities in some dimensions that I had the ability to procrastinate, which meant I never learned the ability to not procrastinate. Uh, you know, ableism is a reduction of ability to one dimension. But um, the, uh, I gotta post that. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I came down with very severe tendonitis in second year from, a, I went from practicing a half an hour a day to thinking, oh, I've got an exam coming. I have to do the conscientious thing and I should practice six hours a day now. And uh, my body kind of gave out and I had very bad tendonitis. I couldn't play piano for two years. And that wow. is part of why I diversified. I, I had originally intended, I guess, to, um, I, I had intended to study many things in parallel, but I kind of was going to finish my music degree first. Um, so I, I, I went parallel faster out of necessity. Um, but that's actually, in a way, that part was good. Uh, that aspect of it was good. Uh, I didn't want to be over-specialized in music, but music was a professional faculty. And so it was, for, it was partly because I had this medical situation that I was allowed to enroll in both faculties. Um, but I think it was great for my education, at least at the start. Um, I mean, I have many criticisms of U of T, but that's not one of them. Um, and so um, then I started taking, I'd already taken electives in math, and linguistics. So I, I branched out. I, I ended up doing a program in cognitive science and AI which I technically finished. I have a thing saying I could graduate if I wanted to because I have that program finished. And philosophy and math, I have like maybe two courses left to do in that. And I think I have one or two courses left to do in the music program. But graduating would actually be bad. Uh, sorry, because then I would have to pay more tuition for electives in computer science. Got a question for you. Uh, inspiration, did anybody inspire like any artists out there, musicians inspire through the whole curriculum of education? Anything that caught your eye or whatever? Like you know, music inspires people in certain ways, like anything for you, that it's anybody that stood out there inspired you as an artist? Musically specifically? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, a lot. Like I, mean, like I, I could just list a bunch of influences. I mean, yeah, let's Bach, hear it. Bach, the Beatles, Nobuo Umatsu, um, mm -hmm. Frank Zappa, especially because he was yeah. also involved in politics and ideas in a very um, sort of overlapping way. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, those would be the top ones. Nobuo Umatsu, yeah. especially. Yeah, keep going. I'm here. Uh, Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, uh, yeah. Janis Joplin, nah, Janice, um, yeah, uh, you know, I was a big fan of the, the Tea Party's Good album in the 90s. <laughs> I mean, I was a teenager in the 90s, so I was exposed to all of that 90s music. Um, I mean, I, I mean, it's 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 funny that you should say that. This is like, I, I'm the same with music as I'm with the political spectrum, I really do listen to everything. Yeah. And um, obviously, there's I go through like obsessive. I gotta listen to this right now. But like, um, then when when I, when I when something doesn't come to my mind, like what should I listen to? I think what have I not listened to? That's my first yeah. question. My my first question is not what do I like. My first question yeah. is what am I missing? And that's how I approach everything. I don't I don't do that in politics either. I don't say what politicians do I like. I say what part of the story am I missing? What arguments in circulation am I missing? Um, how am I going to get a representative sample of everything? To, to get the map to survey the terrain to get the, the map of the territory uh, although they're not the same um so yeah um university was grueling i developed a uh, a bad habit of sleep deprivation uh, oh yeah and so then i eventually got involved in student politics i became a two-term student president oh, of, talk about that. Yeah. yeah yeah i became a two-term student president of the cognitive science and artificial intelligence students association organized a lot of events helped with Conferences organized these discussion groups that went for um, three years um, that were spinoffs of some other groups I'd been attending for years and uh, get people debating and then drinking and more debating and just trying to get um, the intelligentsia coloring outside of the lines a little bit and also offering some free education to people who were uh, hanging around, um, which I think was really important. I was sort of opening the university from the back door and be like, hey, come to this event and like, we'll go through the articles that you can't download for some reason or like, you know, maybe you can find a copy somehow. And uh, <laughs> He used to be able to just walk into the libraries and read the the paper copy, but now it's all electronic. Like, what is that? The public paid for this research. <laughs> That's a, uh, I mean, R.I.P. Aaron Aaron Schwartz. But um, I was recruited to the Pirate Party actually out of student politics, so that's directly related to that. Um, Sean Vouliez, uh somehow saw what I post online and he said, "Hey, you should be involved with the Pirate Party of Canada." And so that was the first time in which I had to seriously think about the prospects of starting a new. What's involved in getting a new party off of the ground long before the Socialist Alliance? When the Socialist Alliance was formed many, many years later, I actually voted for it to be called the Pirate Party of Toronto, um, which is what I think the Shadow Council should really be branded as, something less uh, ideological and more about the actual voting mechanism uh, and the diversity of possible voting mechanisms. We need to experiment with a lot of different voting mechanisms 
And there, it's finally starting to happen in the crypto blockchain space. I'll send you this thing about coordination mechanisms that came out two days ago. They talked for hours and hours and hours about voting systems. And they're like, oh, yeah, we should also talk about ranked choice voting. It's like they went through <laughs> 20 million possibilities. And they're like, oh, yeah, then there's also the possibilities that the normal system is considering changing too. So like our idea of like an innovative system in politics is like a footnote in computer science for all of the other systems they're looking at for possible ways that voting could work. So at any rate, so the Pirate Party was initial eye opener for that. But at the time, I felt that they were getting the political cart ahead of the software development horse. I wanted to focus more on software development and more importantly on theory and uh, not critical theory, like theoretical computer science, uh, theory, voting theory, that kind of thing and how that connected to current events. I'd already done a lot of education that I was now in debt for. So my political education, I decided to get from being in student politics and just from studying it myself, um, publicly available things, just like Wikipedia can't cite something if it's not freely available. I focused on what is the freely available content every day, what's come out in the news. And so I originally had a very religious <laughs> diet of Rachel Maddow, John Stewart, Stephen Colbert. I learned a lot. Rachel Maddow was like my politics professor, you know, <laughs> I was like learning. <laughs> she, she goes to history segments, stuff I didn't know about U.S. politics and no one else was telling it to me. So, you know, that was where I learned a lot. But obviously that meant I was crawling into a very severe echo chamber between John Stewart, Colbert, and especially the old, I mean, well, I don't know, Colbert is like changed, but, um, and, uh, I mean, well, so a couple of things started to shift around and radicalize me a bit more. I, I already knew a lot of radical influences from my mom's friends and like people who had lived in Rochdale and stuff like this. And and I had resolved in high school that it's good to be an educated rebel, that you have to understand the system before you start fucking with it. Because uh, I know that mostly people are lazy and don't want to do their homework. And yeah. a lot of people would rather protest and get a dose of adrenaline than like read a book about political science. And it's like, you have to diversify your time investment. If you're not spending at least equal time reading to what your time you're spending protesting, you're just lazy. Uh, that's what lazy. I think. Uh, that's that's honestly what I believe. Um, now, obviously, if you never protest and spend all your time reading, that's also lazy. Um, mm -hmm. You have to diversify your investment. You, you can't overdo it on any one thing unless you think you know, but guess what? You don't there's a hubris over investing is hubris if you think i know that this is the thing i should spend all my time on you don't you're overconfident usually by most of the time usually you don't know what you should spend your time in so you should divide it up spend some time in the streets spend some time in the books you know spend some time in the debates but you don't overdo it uh, for instance the msa didn't spend really any time going door to door that is hubris we should have invested more in doing that certainly next time around um so uh, let's see, where was I? Oh, so, okay. So university now, before you, you transition from university to more direct politics, you're getting to. Yeah. Well, so um, the, the, I, I am technically still the Toronto strategy coordinator for the Pirate Party, but my strategy was to diversify my investment and not spend. I, I wanted to spend. I knew, I knew we had a lot more to learn. Basically, I thought that. Uh, there's lots of people who who are upset with the government, but they don't have the humility to realize that, like, well, even though you might think these people are evil and working against you, they still know way more than you do, right? It's like it's like you have to be at least as educated as your opponent, not just like complain about the moral status of what they're doing. It's like, well, okay, let's say you're right. Let's let's assume they are evil. In that case, you would better you better buckle down because you're up against it's like evil about, and capable. It's like you said about <laughs> protesting, you gotta know what you're doing. Read and protest. If you don't read, when you're protesting, like what you just said there, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, 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 and diversify, obviously you also want to diversify like YouTube versus print media and like, you know, like radio versus zoom meetings or anything, just like don't spend all your time on one thing. Um, yeah. cause you're, it's probably, cause it might be the right thing for the first 10 minutes you're working on it, but five hours into it, it's no longer the right thing for you spending your time <laughs> on it, probably, you know, whatever you're doing. Um, so yeah. Um, all right. So there were certain influences that radicalized me other than what was already present, um, certain events. So one of those was the G20 in Toronto and uh, Occupy what Wall Street. What, what year was that again, you know? Huh. I don't think in year numbers. I think in terms of narrative structure, the year of G, the, the, the G20 is how I know the year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, okay, and so the of these things are not even that I got, I, around I, the I same got, uh, got 10 minutes left, so I'll keep talking. And I'll let you know when I go to the next session. Just keep yep. talking. So, okay, so... We'll, we'll, we'll finish the chronological narrative, I guess, in this session. So so there were certain radicalizing influences for me. Um, I mean, I'm still a pacifist. If you're listening to this thesis, I'm not like that kind of radical, but... Um, pacifist? <laughs> pacifist. <Sorry. I> <laughs> <had to call. laughs> 
<laughs> well, I'm a, I'm a, well, I'm a pacifist uh, in, in a maybe a more complex sense than some people's. Sometimes you have to accelerate a better conflict to prevent a worse conflict. And I think, for instance, you, we should have all of our non-physical conflicts as quickly as possible to prevent as many physical conflicts as possible. And a lot of people are uh, have a, 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 what do I want to call it, some kind of a, a, a wussy mental pacifism of avoiding even mental conflict. And and if you if you do that, you're you're just you're you're making it someone else's problem. The physical conflicts a few generations down the line. I can't believe you said the word wussy in your own conversation just now. <laughs> well, I mean, you're 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 the one. All that intelligent talking, you're using the word wussy. What's going on with you? Your well, I'm, 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 I'm trying to give some credence to your perspective of your coughing. <laughs> That's what I said. Don't do that. Don't lower yourself. I'm not. Well, I'm not. Lower, I'm just translating. I'm good at translating. And, and well, I had to learn stuff, to as the first <laughs> as the first atheist in my Christian family. I've had to do, learn to translate a few things. But um, okay. go back to your uh, transition. The G twenty was radicalizing yeah. and and yeah. Occupy Wall Street. Um, I remember um weeping watching Occupy Wall Street being dismantled and thinking we we voted Obama in and this is what we get. <laughs> Right, that was very early in Obama's term too. It was just like I remember, yeah, I, mean, I don't know, I'm laughing. But... Okay, and now I can see why people give up on electoralism. Now, for some reason, I haven't. But <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> everybody thinks that if they were in Obama's position, they wouldn't have torn down Occupy Wall Street. I mean, it was all maybe it wasn't really his choice, but because there may be a deep state, but um, it was coordinated all across the country. Uh, all of these Occupy things, and it was similar stuff happening in Toronto and. It was at the time I thought, geez, I thought because I approach everything from a teacher's mentality. You want engagement. You want people to participate. You want them to care and be involved. And you got it. And now you're stopping it. You should be saying, wow, it's so great that everybody came out to participate in politics. We finally have the engagement that we need to have a healthy society. Let's start showing up at these encampments and help them make their demands more um, realistic and specific. And, and and say okay well let let's you know because if you have a child who's screaming on something and their demands don't make sense you try to figure out what they're actually upset about you mm -hmm. know you engage like a respectful concerned parent that is not how the government treated Occupy Wall Street and so that's when it's like okay so we're not all one happy family are we you know <laughs> um, not that I believe that but um, so that was very um, radicalizing to me in the sense that just sticking around in academia wasn't going to cut it. And uh, also the housing collapse in cognitive science and enrollment was frozen for two years and all of the students involved had to buckle down to keep our sort of culture alive for the enrollment to be come back in three years and it's because the housing collapse affected university colleges investments. So you can think, oh, well, I'm not going to get dirty and get involved in like business and politics. I'm just going to study the truth, like almost like going, becoming a monk. That's what some academics kind of thought they were signing up for of being like a monk of the truth. That you go there and you just you sacrifice your life to knowledge and what you get for that sacrifice is knowledge and other people get knowledge and um you, it turns out you can't do that there is no <laughs> i mean maybe you can be a monk at some church somewhere but that church is financed somehow and you know these universities are financed somehow and entire programs can be shut down if the business class fucks up the investment stuff so it's like Okay, so it's, it's, I mean, it was good that I was already involved in the political side of things at that point, but I started looking a lot more carefully at what was going on and studying politics. Now, as I was saying, I climbed into an echo chamber. Um, then, um, well, Donald Trump won. And I had told myself, I'm going to spend a lot more time in politics if Donald Trump wins. <laughs> I, I had been doing teaching and, you know, programming and various things, event, event planning and just, and music, cultural. I, I devoted a good chunk of time to developing my current musical language, improvising, going to open mics, soaking up the local sound. But then I was like, okay, well, if Donald Trump wins, I can't just like culturally organize in the city. I have to study politics like directly more actively. And so I quadrupled my time spent studying politics. And because they had given, the New York Times gave Hillary a 98% chance of victory. I was like, okay, I've got to get out of this info bubble. Um, and so and now I consume the entire political spectrum uh, religiously. Every day I look at what videos have come out today. And as a logician, like I studied formal logic in the philosophy program and tutored formal logic a lot. I am studying arguments the way an epidemiologist might study viruses. I am seeing what arguments are in circulation. I don't care if it comes from the left or it comes from the right. It's a new argument that a person's making to a person. And is that argument right? And if it's wrong, if it's sending people in the wrong direction, 
Um, I like what Emma Vigeland called a logic strain on the majority report recently, the idea that like there's a line of argument, but then that line replicates into a new strain, a new strain, a new strain. And you can see new strains emerge and you can detect where people are getting their, their shit and see what strain they have. You're like, oh, this is good shit. Where did you get it? <laughs> or you see, oh, this is a bad argument. Where did you get it? You know, because I'm always trying to figure out what people need to learn and how to optimize our learning rate. I found that if you work backwards from learning rate, whether it's in machine learning or politics or education, it, you don't have to ask many other questions other than how to increase learning rate. If yeah. people do something wrong, you can say, what did they not learn? What do they need to learn? If you do something wrong, you can say, what did I not learn? What do I need to learn? You know, and how can I learn it faster? And one way I learn it faster is by speeding up those news news videos that I watch every day. But I would encourage everyone to try to get out of the info bubbles that we've all crawled into. Then it's created this thing called the Daily Me. You can look up, there was an old article about that years ago, the Daily Me, that the internet just serves you a bubble tailored to you because they want to keep you on there because you are the product. And uh, the system is not tailored towards getting you a representative sample of anything as much as that would be a basic thing if we were all monks of the truth and working backwards from what increases learning rate, we would say, okay, we need computer systems that give people a representative sample of what they're missing. But the daily me doesn't give you what you're missing. It gives you what you're already clicking on. And so um, don't don't just give in to the black hole of autopilot in terms of the research that we are, we're all doing research every day on social media, but we're not keeping a research log. We're not thinking about what we're missing. We're not doing a proper lit review and saying, okay, well, here's a sample of the popular media. What, you know, what what is the shadow of this? What is What is outside of all of this? You know? And um, spend more time on Google Scholar, folks. <laughs> yeah. Search by year, know what year the music is you're listening to, listen historically to music, listen historically to politics. Say, what year is this from? Where are we in history right now? And that'll probably, well, that would be a good question for our second half, actually, which is where are we in history? I got, uh, I got two minutes left, so. Uh, yeah, so your thoughts, Bill? Yeah, when it cuts off there, I'll go up the next session did uh, another 20 minutes. So but anyways, uh, so transition to the uh, politics, uh, before you get cut off there, yeah, it, 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 well, and then it, Tory sued Khalil Save Right. <laughs> all, all that stuff started happening with the encampments here in Toronto, and so that yeah, yeah. we'll get to, the municipal. We'll do the next session. We'll do the next session with that one. But yeah. just quick question, quick question to you before I hang up your favorite favorite book. Any books you love? Um, the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. Okay, nonfiction. Of course. Fiction. I'm not a big fan of fiction. Pick one. What do you? What stands up for you? The Lord of the Rings. Oh, okay. All three, eh? Or all four? What about the Similarian? Did you like that? I like the I like the first chapter a lot because it's about music. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I don't That's like all answer. the elf names. I don't know how to pronounce them. No, no, no. no. Well, <laughs> I think you know what I realized for that reason. I should probably listen to the Silmarillion audiobook because some yeah, were yeah, slow. Yeah. Is their job to practice their elvish? And get all those names pronounced right. So yeah, that's why I asked you about that. That's, that's, that's the first one I read. The similar, that's my favorite. Yeah. You know. So, anyways, I'm gonna get one more minute left. So, next session we'll talk about the Baltics. Uh, if you've got your book, favorite artist. Well, right I don't know much about the Baltics, but I know about the encampments here in Toronto. Yeah, yeah, we'll talk about them. Any artists right now you're listening to that stand up for you? Musically. Yeah. Frank Zappa. Frank Zappa, yeah. That's all you need. He has yeah, sixty. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're gonna we're gonna go see some Beethoven tonight. We're gonna see Beethoven's Fifth at her house. Oh, fifth! I was talking about the fifth. What about the rest of it? Oh, I, I took all, I studied them all and then took a course on them all. Well, any questions? Okay, I'm gonna go. I'm, I'm gonna, gonna get cut off. A whole episode gonna, on any stop. of Beethoven symphonies. I'm gonna stop recording here. I'll get cut off when I stop. So next session, we'll right, talk about like politics. Hang on, hang on here. So I should say recording stop. Heard 